E te iwi e hui nei, kia ora tātou, ki a koranga tera e rere tonu ana, nā mihi nui ki a koutou. Kua hui hui mai nei e tenei rā, ki tau toko e te kaupapa o tērā. Tenei, te mihi nui, te mihi mahana ki a koutou. He whai whai aki i nga mihi e ki ana te whakatauki nga tōraru, nga tokoraru, ka ora ai te iwi. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here on behalf of the Green Building Council. You know, we're really delighted for you to join us today. You know, and I really want to thank Auckland Council and Auckland Conversations for wanting to collaborate with us and work with us to help celebrate Te Wiki o Te Hanana Tautaio o Te Au World Green Building Week with us. Um, this week is the biggest week on the global green building um, calendar. And we've been joined by thousands of other New Zealanders, like you in the room, that have been buoyed by the increased awareness of the need for better, healthier buildings. You know, in the last two years, we've seen a huge surge in green financing schemes. Gareth Hughes last night down in Parliament was mentioning how close our zero carbon legislation was coming. We've also seen hundreds of organisations now sign up to the Climate Leaders Coalition commitment. And later this week, we're going to see hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of New Zealanders, and hopefully most of you in the room, taking to the streets on Friday for the climate strikes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very clear that the science, industry, politics and people are all demanding a better, more sustainable future. So the challenge is upon us to rein in the building and construction emissions, you know, emissions that have risen more than 66% in the last decade and are the equivalent to more than a million cars on our roads every year. With 20% of our country's carbon footprint coming from the built environment, it's certainly time for us to set a pathway for reducing our climate pollution from our buildings. And that's why the New Zealand Green Building Council was delighted yesterday to launch the Zero Carbon Roadmap for Aotearoa's buildings. And in this document, it sets out how zero carbon is going to be measured and identified, and also how we're going to verify that, and also how it's going to evolve in Aotearoa. Also yesterday, we launched the Zero Carbon for Building Operations Certification. And this looks at three key aspects, putting energy efficiency first, followed by on-site energy generation, and finally offsetting. And it also sets out how those benchmarks are going to be ratcheted up over time. And following this, this next year, we'll be launching zero carbon for new buildings and also finally homes. But also, it's very clear to us that a zero carbon certification isn't a standalone tool to achieve zero emissions. Throughout the document, we've identified significant milestones that both the government and industry must achieve to work together to decarbonise our buildings. And these include a stepped improvement to our building code, a significant increase in the transparency around the energy efficiency of our buildings, and also a big call for key government ministries and departments to lead a real transformational shift to greener buildings. And so once all parts of this pathway are in place, our building and construction sector will be zero carbon, and it will be the greatest achievement ever, I believe, for our industry in Aotearoa. And the first step is very simple. All we need to do is measure the footprint of the building in which we work, own or tenant. And this first step will ensure that by 2050, our buildings will be the zero carbon, special, healthy places that we all deserve. And so obviously this was a combined effort in putting this together, so I really wanted to take some time to thank some really key people. You know, we travelled the country and we spoke to and listened to plenty of New Zealanders, to architects, to engineers, to building owners and facility managers, to product and materials suppliers. And we've captured some really great stories from people that are acting now and taking significant steps to achieve this. And together we've set a realistic pathway for achieving zero carbon buildings. So a huge thank you to everyone that's involved in those stories we captured. To Argosy, Baileys, Precinct, Warren, Amani and Razine, thank you for supporting this work and ensuring that it gets done. And to Ika, who may not all sort of agree with everything in this roadmap, but they've certainly been the stewards of the Neighbour Scheme and brought it to New Zealand. 
and also to Temper Zone and Baileys. Every day, the Green Building Council is encouraged by your support and your own commitment to the cause. We thank you for that. And also to the Environmark Solutions team that we've worked alongside this with. You know, a hugely passionate, inspiring team. It's been an absolute pleasure working with you. And to our own team at the Green Building Council, it's been a tremendous few years getting to this point, and everyone works so tirelessly to the cause, so we can't thank you enough. And I know our CEO, Andrew Eagles, is very disappointed to not be here tonight. So climate change is our greatest challenge. And by joining together and acting now, we can tell a new story, a new story to New Zealand businesses, to other sectors, but just as importantly, a new story to property sectors around the world. You know, according to the Whakatauki, nā tōraru, nā tokuraru, ka ora ai te iwi. By working in isolation, we may result in survival, but if we work together, we can move beyond survival and into prosperity. It is a big challenge but we are going to do it together. So I really encourage you to pick up this document. There will be copies available at the back of the room tonight before you leave, and to see where you can start to join in the challenge. You don't want to see that. So this brings me to the rest of the evening. You know, we identified that not all the solutions are going to be easy, and they may involve some really difficult challenges. But we have to accept these challenges and deploy solutions very quickly. And throughout this week, we've been debating various solutions. Last night, down in Wellington, looking at peak, energy, peak electricity demand. Tomorrow in Christchurch, looking at fossil fuels. And tonight, the challenge of tackling polluting products and materials. And I certainly don't think there's anyone better that can lead this discussion. It doesn't need much of an introduction. You know, as a regular public thinker on numerous topics, including deep sustainability, business, economics, innovation, creativity and entrepreneurship, not only from a New Zealand context, but a global context. You know, his thinking on why we do business and how we evolve our business certainly challenges, inspires and creates real space for transformational dialogue. So, mi kore aki koe, hi toku toi a mato, kia ora rod, I welcome you to lead us forward. Um, kia ora sato, good evening, and uh, thank you very much for joining us for this evening's discussion um, and um, about um, this particular topic, about um, tackling polluting uh, materials and building products on our journey to a zero carbon economy. Um, and also greetings to people who are joining us via live stream, um, and uh, thank you very much for being with us virtually, and I'll explain in due course how you'll be able to um, get questions to us through Slido, and I'll come to that in a, um, a, a few moments. Um, it is indeed, as Joe said, um, quite an extraordinary week around the world, um, being World Green um, Building Week. Um, and um, needless to say, it was obviously perfectly timed for the UN's um, uh, climate summit, uh, which started yesterday in New York. And um, already very memorable moments from that. Um, our Prime Minister did a fine job of uh, laying out New Zealand's ambitions, where we have some strengths um, on these issues uh, and where we have some needs. And the um, overwhelming um, appeal she made um, that we need to be able to um, share those ideas and, and trade products and technologies and the like around the world to make that happen. Um, but of course, um, probably most memorable of all uh, was the wonderful look that Greta Thunberg gave Donald Trump as he walked by, um, which I think is, um, should be wonderfully etched in all our minds. Um, that he was there not to talk about climate, um, but to uh, address a freedom of religion event that he had uh, asked for and called for um, is a rather difficult thing for me to try to unpack, and I won't even try. Um, our great opportunity, though, here in New Zealand um, is on our journey to a zero-carbon economy over these few decades ahead um, to make um, substantial improvements and changes environmentally, economically, socially, and reinforce so many of our cultural values um, in all of this. 
And um, I just wanted to um, give particular thanks and pay tribute to um, for the New Zealand Green Building Council for its work over the years, um, but particularly for the roadmap um, just released yesterday. Um, and for de, um, and, uh, designing a whole week of um, events around the country, of which the um, in, um, panel discussion last night in Wellington, tonight here in Auckland, and tomorrow night in Christchurch are part of that. Last night, we had a very good discussion about how to meet uh, the peak demand for electricity um, through very big efficiency gains, um, um, but also making sure we do that through uh, renewables as well. Um, and um, our panelists there were very clear that there is a, a, a daunting uh, series of interlocking issues there, uh, uh, whether from um, competing incentives, um, i.e. the generators love peak demand because that's when they make their big profits, um, but the lines company hate it because that's when they have to um, have the maximum investment um, to meet that peak demand. Um, so at the moment, we are really quite at sea about how we bring um, those uh, disparate and competing um, parts of uh, the electricity supply and demand picture together. But out of it, there was some very um, um, thoughtful, very encouraging contributions from the panelists. All that was recorded. Um, so once that's available um, on the um, Building Council's website, um, I would encourage you to look at it. Um, now, in terms of tonight, uh, a very simple format. I'm about to welcome up four um, terrific panelists, um, giving us um, four very different, but again, very complementary perspectives on uh, the complicated issue we're discussing. Then, um, after they have presented for five minutes each, we will get into a discussion. Now, because of the size of the sellout audience here, we won't have a chance to get microphones around to people who have got questions. Um, so uh, th what we're going to do is to use entirely Slido. So if you um, get out your phones and go to slido.com, very simple process, you will see um, a logins required to get you to the right meeting. Um, and so for this one, it's um, hash um, tag building life for the capital B and a capital L. Um, then Joe and Lena will be likely moderating the questions coming in um, to um, sort of uh, arrange them in, in a useful order for us up here um, to uh, work our way through. Um, but of course, please, please do uh, be looking at the questions as they're coming through. They might spark um, a question, an additional question you might want to ask. But crucially, you can also upvote questions. Um, and so that's a very big help um, to me um, to try to um, choose the questions which are most relevant to you to put to our panelists. Um, I won't go through those questions uh, literally from the most popular on down. I, I will, I will um, move around a bit, and I'll also be throwing in a few of my own questions. And I know we won't have a chance to deal with all the questions that come through, um, but we um, have a hope that we can um, collect all of those questions um, and provide answers for some, uh, or a good many of them, um, again um, after the event. Um, and then after all of that, uh, I will simply um, summarize and um, uh, thank everyone and close the event. And then at 7 o'clock, uh, close this speaking part of the event, because then will be more time for drinks and networking afterwards. Um, just a little bit more um, housekeeping. I've got some additional um, thank yous in addition to um, all the sponsors that you see um, coming through on the screen, um, particularly Auckland Council, um, uh, the, uh, our Auckland Conversations partner, uh, South Base Construction and Design partner, Resine, and all um, Auckland Conversation Program supporters. Um, and I'm sure that's a, a large factor in the turnout tonight. Um, we'd also just like to encourage you to um, um, believe in democracy and act on democracy. And, of course, the local election voting is now open uh, for postal ballots um, and uh, closing on the 12th of October. And uh, we'd like to encourage you to take part in that. Voting is very quick and easy. Well, at least until you get to the health board. That's a, a bit of a mind bender. Um, just rank them in your order of preference. It's as simple as that. Um, and um, so uh, please do um, 
uh, do engage because the quality of um, our local politics, our local government, is crucial to this. I would just add my own uh, personal note to this. Um, I'm a great fan of the work that Generation Zero does uh, in many respects, but particularly in the interviews it does with uh, candidates and their ratings of them, as they have done in past elections too. So you'll find that a, a useful guide. One last thank you. I turned up on my bike uh, just as I thought it was about to rain, and I was very delighted to see this canopy being put up outside by Bike Auckland. Um, d hands up people who availed themselves of the valet bike parking. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Well, um, so thank you to Bike Auckland, in particular Fiona and Sean out there um, for that. Um, a few health and safety things. Um, uh, should there be the need for an evacuation, there will be an alarm sounded. So please just follow the instructions of the venue staff um, out through those exits at the back um, and um, assemble out in Altair Square. Um, and um, smoking, this is of course a non-smoking venue. Um, if you need to smoke, please do that outside, but not near the bicycles. Um, sorry, it's strange juxtaposition. Uh, bathrooms are located in the foyer um, by the internal staircase and um, should anyone need first aid, um, there are first aid assistants um, amongst the venue staff. And so that's all the housekeeping and now if I could welcome up our four panelists and once they've got them all seated here I'll introduce you to them. Uh, Come on up, all four of you, and then um, we will go straight into the um, uh, presentations. First of all, um, it's my great pleasure to um, introduce um, on the far side of the stage from me, Jeff Vickers, who's the technical director of ThinkStep in New Zealand. And Jeff's been um, embedding sustainable thinking within organizations for well over a decade and working across um, sustainability assessment, strategy, and innovation um, in, in very complex life cycle businesses, um, such as in the building and agriculture, transport, and electronic sectors. And um, he's worked with such organizations as Fletcher Building, New Zealand Steel, Downer, Lend Lease, and the European Commission. So um, a big hand for Jeff, please. Thank you very much indeed. Um, next to uh, Jeff is Helen Jenkins, who's General Manager of Sustainability at Fletcher Building. Um, Helen is a sustainability professional specializing in carbon reduction, um, particularly in infrastructure and the building materials sector, um, and is a very strong advocate for embedding carbon reduction initiatives within existing strategies. So uh, over the last 10 years, um, Helen's worked uh, across a number of sectors such as road rail and utilities for companies or organizations such as Network Rail and Anglian Water in the UK and Auckland Airport um, here in New Zealand and of course now at Fletcher Building. So uh, a big hand for Helen, please. Thank you. Um, and next along, uh, next to Helen, is Sean McIsaac, who's the Director and Senior Building Enclosure Engineer at Oculus Architectural Engineering. Um, so a specialist, of course, um, in enclosures, uh, whether they be windows, walls, and roofs uh, of buildings of all types. Um, Sean has very wide experience um, and that he has been putting to great use here in New Zealand since 2016. So a big hand for Sean, please. Thank you very much indeed. Um, you might have spotted his t-shirt, Make Less CO2. I'm not sure it has quite the same ring as Make Peace Not War or Make Love Not War, but maybe we'll get there um, on our journey. Not tonight, it's a, long, it's a longer term project. And um, then next to Sean, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Sally Gray, um, who at Auckland Council is the manager of Premium Building um, Consents. Um, so, uh, Sally came to building consent through managing the weather type litigation issues for a very good few years. And, uh, uh, 
uh, and before that was an in-house legal counsel for several Auckland um, companies. So she's um, been very um, deeply involved in um, how much work it is to put things right um, after they've gone wrong. Um, and, and I'm sure that very much shapes her thinking these days about how to um, build right from the very beginning. So um, a very big hand for Sally, please. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so I'm going to um, hand straight over to um, Jeff. I'm going to nip into his seat um, rather than loiter by the door here. Um, and um, so uh, over to you, Jeff. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rob, for the kind introduction. Is this on? Yeah, great. So kia ora koutou. Um, tonight I want to talk to you about a couple of public reports that we've recently released. So. ThinkStep as an organisation works to help companies and other organisations succeed sustainably. And one of the key ways we do that through is trying to work out what matters. Um, so we use a tool called life cycle assessment and materiality assessment to try and work out where some of the big hotspots are and then to identify strategies to reduce them. So in the last sort of year, year and a half, we've released two public reports on the built environment. The first one was focused on quantifying kind of the significance of the built environment to the New Zealand, the carbon footprint of New Zealand. And that's where you sometimes hear this 20% number being quoted. That comes from one of our early reports, and I'll kind of get to that in a moment. And the next report I want to talk about is one called Under Construction, which was released last month, and sort of demonstrates the potential for building products and building materials to be decarbonised, looking at it from a supply side. So I'm going to probably try and dance around a little bit while I talk. Um, I hope it doesn't make any of you dizzy, but it gives me something to do with my feet. Okay, so what I want to do first is just sort of highlight some of the context for our work. So back in 2016, 2017, there were a series of reports released on New Zealand's carbon footprint at a national level. And there was one well-known one by the Royal Society, one by Globe New Zealand, and another one <clears throat> um, by the Productivity Commission, the first part of that being the issues paper. And those reports talked about the built environment, but because their focus is very much on what we produce as a nation, they are really focused on energy generation, for example, and this big, bold category of industry which produces all of our stuff, which goes into lots of different places. Um, and so what those reports commonly said is that the built environment contributes sort of 2% or maybe 5% or maybe 8% of our carbon footprint, looking at energy only. But it was very focused on operational emissions. Um, it didn't look at, and deliberately so, didn't look at the impact of making materials. Those em emissions that we would refer to as embodied emissions or upfront emissions, those things that are typically hidden, involved in making the materials, whether that's steel or concrete, or the cement used to make the concrete, or the timber products that we use, or whatever it happens to be. So those embodied or upfront emissions are what we wanted to investigate in a bit more detail. And so in 2017-2018, in we started trying to quantify what those emissions were and separating them out from these big groups of you know, energy, industry, um, you know, waste management. And so the first thing that you see here is this is the kind of traditional view. This is New Zealand's greenhouse gas inventory. You can see a big number there for energy. And of that, about 5% of the total number comes from the built environment. But if you look at that in a different way and you consider what we consume as individuals, not what we produce, so we also account for the carbon embodied in trade, the things that we import that we don't make, and, then, and that's across the board, not just in buildings, but also importing cars and textiles, for example, and the fact that as we as New Zealanders um, and we as a nation are a net exporter of carbon through our agricultural products in particular, exporting dairy products, exporting beef and lamb, etc., you know, those products we export about 90% by value. So what happens when you look at things in terms of what we consume, where we've got an ability to change it as a, as a consumer or as a business, our carbon footprint as a nation shrinks, so you can see it goes from about 17 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, a very sexy unit I know, down to 13 tonnes. Um, and what you can see is a complete shift in how things sort of stack up. So all of a sudden, the built environment, rather than being this kind of token 5% within energy use, and then kind of some part of industry that we can't quantify, it becomes about 20% of our carbon footprint, because the whole carbon footprint shrinks, and we're focused more on what we're using. And if you break that down even further, where does that 20% come from? A big chunk of it is actually from materials. And I need to caveat that, that it's also the materials used in infrastructure, so it's infrastructure and buildings, but you can see these big numbers here, materials and also imported emissions in terms of things that we bring into this country that we don't make ourselves. And some of those things are professional services and things too, it's not just materials, but some of that is certainly the materials themselves. So 
what this shows is that in New Zealand, in our local context, embodied emissions, the upfront stuff, the stuff that's built into the buildings before you even get into them, those kind of hidden emissions, those matter in New Zealand. They really, really matter. And there, you know, in this, in this report, it was about 50%. In specific buildings, it's not that high. Maybe it's 30% or whatever. But the point is, is that they really matter in the New Zealand context because our energy mix is already quite clean. We've already decarbonized our energy mix to a large extent. It was already quite low carbon. Um, we use a lot of hydro, we a lot of wind, geothermal. We are a little bit unlike other countries who are still using a lot of fossil fuels to produce their electricity. And so that makes the New Zealand context a bit different, and it means we're a little bit further ahead on the embodied emissions game, because for us, it's more relevant already right now. And importantly, those emissions are being emitted now, whereas the emissions across the building's life are being emitted over a whole period of time. You know, the building might last 60 years or 90 years, whereas the embodied emissions are mostly happening now when the thing gets built. And so what can we do about it? Well, we looked at another piece of work that we released last month. It's titled Under Construction. And we showed that we can reduce those emissions by 40% by 2050 by, building, by producing our building materials in a smarter way. Um, you know, if you look at where the hotspots are in terms of the built environment, you know, the big ticket items are things like concrete, steel, aluminium, um, and you know, certain other materials also pop up depending on the context, like paint and plasterboard and other things. But those materials, you know, a, a, as well as in certain contexts, timber, are very significant from a carbon footprint perspective. And so we can reduce that by 40% if we design our materials and building products in the right way, if we change the way we manufacture things, and if we decarbonize the production of materials. And this is very much a supply side focus, but if we also work on uh, consumption and sort of a, a demand side and build buildings in a better way, use fewer materials to start with, focus on choosing the right materials, then we can have a kind of win twice situation where the materials to begin with are really low carbon, but we're also using fewer of them. So two of the points that the report highlighted which aren't shown here are really the need for collaboration and for innovation. Innovation to drive down the impact of materials, but collaboration throughout the entire supply chain to really encourage the uptake of them. Because if no one's demanding them, they won't be produced. And if specifiers aren't specifying them, they won't be produced. And if building product manufacturers don't have long-term supply contracts in place, perhaps, for example, they can't justify the investment to overhaul their manufacturing equipment, for example, when they also have to compete with imported product. And so I think you know, collaboration and innovation are two things that have to go hand in hand to achieve these kinds of reductions. And that saving of 40% you know, in the embodied emissions is equivalent to about half a million cars off the road permanently. Um, because we're building these buildings every year, we can take the equivalent of about half a million cars off the road if we go down this path. Um, and you know, finally, I just wanted to put a link to the report up there. You can download it if you're interested. You can also download our earlier report um, and find out a little bit more about how we can potentially decarbonise New Zealand's built environment together. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much indeed, Jeff, um, for stepping us through that. And um, those are certainly very encouraging um, targets that, for us to go for in the coming years. Um, <coughs> excuse me, over to you, Helen. Uh, a big hand for Helen, please. Thank you very much indeed. Good evening, everyone. Kia ora tato. Um, so I'm going to pick up on um, some themes that may become the themes of the evening, actually. Um, Thinking about where we could make some big shifts in the actual production of building materials, uh, there's an aspect of making what we what we build build buildings out of more sustainable, and there's also a need to look at what are the kind of shifts we need in the construction industry itself. So, one of the areas we really need to focus on is lower carbon materials, more sustainable materials, lower carbon materials, and as Jeff pointed out. The carbon that's locked inside building materials can be a little bit hidden. So a really big lever to get to more sustainable materials is, is actually doing a life cycle assessment of you know, what you're manufacturing that then goes into a building. Um, and it certainly, with Fletcher Building, it's a huge focus for us to have environmental product declarations that actually identify that. Um, and in fact, starting with the difficult end of things. So we have those in place already for our, um, our cement insulation, um, wall walls products, and some of our steel products, but, f but really intend to roll EPDs out for the entire product line that we make because 
they do two really important things. One is that they would point to the areas where you are having an impact and therefore can improve internally as a manufacturer, but secondarily, and I think more importantly, and this is why I'm a huge advocate for doing this more widely within the industry, if you really know the impact of a building product, when you're at that early design stage and you have the opportunity to optioneer, you have the opportunity to choose a different range of materials, it's only that life cycle analysis of the materials that you're choosing that will let you make a decision that's genuinely better in terms of design. Um, and that leads us on to another point that Jeff made, which is that the better materials part of the, the problem, it, it does need innovation, and we need innovation with an agility of building specification and standards that allows for that innovation, but we absolutely need to maintain technical and quality standards for building. So those two things really have to work in tandem. Also, in terms of the kinds of shifts that could be made in the wider industry, there's another part of the puzzle that fits into better materials and better design, which is looking at doing more design up front, so more 3D design, designing something in the virtual world before you design it in the real world. It gives you much more scope to optioneer for better products if you're building something digitally than if you're building it physically. It's cheaper and it's faster. So using, making more use of 3D design is an area where New Zealand really can expand. Um, and then flowing on from that also is other ways of, of constructing. So making more use of modular construction, by, by which I mean sort of building entire components of the building off-site in a manufacturing kind of environment, where you get um, a very, very good, consistent standard of quality, um, and also you get the benefits of generally using far lower, mater far lower materials used per build than building when you build on-site. So they are two very powerful levers we can use, that, that design, it, design it digitally and, and build it, build it off-site to the extent that that's possible. But all of those parts of the, of, the, of the picture, so having better and more sustainable lower carbon materials, having smarter design, more, more optioneered design, and then making more use of of the most recent construction materials, that really requires collaboration across the whole of the construction industry, um, designers and specifiers and constructors and, and end clients. Um, and it's really that, um, that, I guess, that shared vision, those shared targets um, and the collaboration that is, what, that is what we need to make the shift that we all want to see and actually to get the outcomes that we all want to see, to get our 40% by 2050. Um, so I guess we're here because, as an organisation, and I'm here personally because I'm very excited by the opportunity to be part of that, that shift. As some of you will know, um, we're in the process of getting our science-based target verified. That's a 30% reduction by 2030, a 50% reduction by 2050. Um, and also very core to what we want to do as a building products co company is look at the life cycle analysis of, of what we sell. So try and be part of that, um, part of that collaboration and part of that, part of that journey. Um, um, thank you very much indeed, Helen, um, for um, suggesting some um, uh, very powerful pathways by which we might be able to progress these issues. Um, and now I hand over to um, Sean. A very big hand for Sean, please. Thank you very much indeed. Hi, everyone. Hi, people at home. Um, I, um, I want to talk about the crisis happening in front of us. Um, it's ignoring science, um, and it goes beyond just climate. Um, it's, it's kind of everywhere through our culture right now. Um, I don't know why that is. Um, it seems that recently there's been um, more and more of it happening. Um, we see it every single day. Um, I'm an engineer, so I get to look at science. I get to look at products. I get to make evaluations based on science and physics. Um, and then I go to a design meeting and suggest a product. And the first question I get asked is, has it been used in New Zealand before? I don't really understand why that happens. Um, I, th I think it's a, a fear. Um, I think it's a little bit of um, trying to direct blame elsewhere. It's trying to uh, keep your hands off of, off of the pie, so to speak. Um, but I think if we, don't, if we don't stop that kind of mentality, we're, not, we're just going to be stuck where we're at. Um, we've got scientists telling us we need to, you're not a scientist, Jeff, are you? Uh, 
Yeah, so Jeff's got some scientists at work for him probably. Um, they're telling us we need, we need lower carbon products. Um, we need to build with less carbon. We've got Helen's companies building lower carbon products. We've got those to use. Um, then I've got to go and convince Auckland Council that that new product that we've got is going to be fit for purpose, maybe for the first time it's ever been used before. Um, so until we, until we start to change this mentality of questioning things, it has to, be, has to be, have 10 years of track record to be used, we're just going to be stuck doing the same thing we've been doing um, for the last few decades. Um, we've got a wonderful research branch, actually. Brands does some amazing science and research. Um, and for as much flack as I give them, um, they actually do have a lot of really good things coming out of there. The really big problem is it's been around for 30 years, and a lot of the research um, is a footnote at the bottom of a policy paper that happens 20 years later. Um, so I think we need to start um, listening to the science. We need to start looking for um, solutions that have track records from overseas that we can borrow. We need to start adopting those ideas. Um, this is not a very big country, guys. I come from Canada, um, so it's not a very big country. Lovely country, I love it. Um, but if we're going to do this in a, in a rapid, sustainable fashion, very, very quickly, we've got things we can borrow, we can bring in, um, and then people like myself that can evaluate it and explain it to council and get building consents. Um, that's all I had just to open with. I'm looking forward to questions from everyone. I see there's lots of questions coming in, so thank you very much. Um, thank you very much indeed, Sean, um, um, for getting us going on that, uh, particularly from your perspective as um, someone uh, d designing buildings um, and using materials, and a, a very good point there about brands. And, um, and on to Sally, please. A very big hand for Sally. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, I have a few notes, because unlike my fellow panellists, I don't work in this area all the time, and I wanted to keep on track and provide information of interest, and it's a privilege to be on the stage with you all. I made some notes during the week of what I wanted to say, and then I read the newsroom article yesterday on the Green Building Council report, and I thought, job done. It really covered everything that I thought needed to be said from me. Um, for those of you who haven't read it, it was... It, it made a call for an amendment to the building code as a primary tool for change. I agree. It called to introduce building energy labels. I agree. And it called for market action. And for that, I agree too. As most of you are aware, that Auckland Council, as a building consent authority, operates under the Building Act and the building code that's contained within regulation. We receive, we assess, we approve, we inspect, and we certify building work against the building code. When I look through the Building Act, the purpose makes reference to sustainability. It mentions ensuring buildings are designed, constructed and able to be used in ways to promote sustainable development. Cool. And it's also mentioned in the principles in section four, but there's no mechanism for us to actually enforce that. So it means if we receive an application that demonstrates compliance, against the relevant clauses in the building code, we have to approve it. It may contain nothing about sustainability. It may have the worst polluting products. But as a building consent authority, we go tick. So I think if we want to change, we have to change those regulatory settings. From a synchronicity of timing, earlier this year, MB released a consultation paper that covered five key areas of building reform. Um, I was at a talk recently where Minister Salisa indicated that the amount of work to deliver on all five key areas was enormous, and they were likely to be prioritizing two for more immediate um, delivery, and one of those was modern methods of construction. So I could see some real synchronicity in what we all want to see happen. Um, when I read through both the consultation paper and the feedback summary, there's not a lot around sustainability, to be honest. It's very much focused on durability and safety. And on the back end of decades or more of leaky buildings, I can understand that focus. Um, but it does strike me that it's the ideal time to really be promoting these more sustainable principles into the construction of our buildings. In terms of opportunity, Auckland Council approves 
more than 20,000 building consents every year. This year we will exceed 24,000, of which 14,000 will be new builds. So to me that is, you know, lots of potential. I spoke to one of our um, key, well, we have a number of high volume building um, developers in Auckland, and I spoke to one of them to understand what might be some of the barriers to driving more sustainability in, in the buildings they build outside of legislative change. And the feedback to me was that consumers are very price sensitive. There's a lot of interest in sustainability and how it is built and how it's designed for future um, reduced environmental impact, but there's no appetite to pay for it. So it struck me that timber and concrete and steel may not be glamorous enough, um, and the money is really put into those more glamour products like bench tops and bathrooms, and that's where I think the legislative change is, it, it, we need it to make that kind of consumer difference. I would say if you are a manufacturer or an importer and you are manufacturing or importing a product that has a better environmental footprint than something on the market already, don't lose sight that you should be investing in ensuring it's tested to the appropriate standard, it is appraised or it's certified, because that makes it a lot easier for designers to specify. It also makes it a lot easier for us as a building consenting authority to approve. Now, to probably preempt a question that might come through, can we prioritise some work over other work? Of course we can. Um, Auckland currently has approximately 45,000 houses fewer than we need, um, and currently that's our priority. Council has a, um, a multi-faced role, I guess you could say. I know I've got some colleagues from our waste team here, which is one aspect. Council is also an owner of many buildings, um, and I've been advised that this next year we will set a green asset standard for council and community facilities, and we will track and report infrastructure carbon as part of Auckland Council's emiss emission inventory. Council also gets involved in policy development and has a stewardship role for both the development and support for communities. And one key role we can do to deliver that for Auckland is to encourage growth, both in a compact nature and near public hubs, the public transport hubs, to get people out of their private cars. Now, I want to finish on two random observations. While Auckland is becoming, to a degree, self-regulating in the size of houses it's building because of the price, the average size alone for a standalone house in New Zealand over the last 17 years, every year has been over 200 square metres, and for 10 of those 17 years has been 230 square metres or more. And it kind of begs the question, if we aren't serious about carbon and carbon emissions and reducing them, is that okay? And my second observation is the New Zealand Building Code only requires joinery and facades to be designed and manufactured to last for 15 years, and for structural elements to last for 50. Is that okay? Oh, fine, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you for making some uh, very pertinent um, judgments and observations there. Um, and um, putting out uh, that incredibly Im important point at the end there about the very short time frame that we uh, are um, designed uh, and building or creating products for, um, that whether it be 15 years or, or the 50 years for the structural elements. Um, let me just start actually at that point across the panel. Um, is there um, good evidence um, that shows the economic value um, of designing and um, buildings and creating products um, that have a longer life um, than we are currently um, tending to build in New Zealand? Any, any takers on that? You can, are you going to ask Auckland Council what they think about, the, about that? Um, Listen, if you build a building and have to rebuild it 10 years later, you're using twice the carbon. Um, you're using twice the amount of, of money to build that thing again. And maybe you build it wrong the second time and you're rebuilding it the third time. 
Um, the most sustainable thing you can do is build a building that lasts a long time. Yeah. Any other take, uh, Jeff, from your perspective and the sort of analysis you do? Yeah, I don't know if I can always comment on a cost from a cost perspective, but certainly it seems that you know building it frequently would be very expensive. Um, I mean, also my, from my experience as well is that if you if you design say a a roofing material or a cladding material, particularly for a multi-storey building, and you make that perform poorly, um, and so that it needs to be replaced regularly. You know, health and safety regulation is the way it is now. It's actually incredibly expensive to go up there and replace a roof, for example, because you have to have all the scaffolding in place, all the cranes, everything set up. To, you know, and it's a very expensive exercise. So certainly, from a um, from a life cycle, you know, environmental life cycle assessment perspective, it makes sense to design things that last. But certainly, also, I would say to, not to mark, make them last necessarily indefinitely because we know that buildings do get pulled down, so we don't want to make things that last too much longer than they need to last. So in the New Zealand context, a, a house typically lasts about 90 years and a commercial building about 60. So there's no point designing a building, a commercial building that's going to last for 500 years, potentially, because it might not be fit for purpose and you kind of over-engineered it as well. So I think there's a balance to find there, but I would say certainly 50 years for structural materials and 15 years for cladding is far below what our buildings are currently being turned over, at the rate they're being turned over at. So that sounds very problematic from a, you know, Building, building perspective. Yeah. Um, off the top of the head, do, do any of you on the panel have any international perspective on that in terms of uh, the sort of expectations in other countries about longevity of materials and uh, structures? Any sense um, of that? Certainly not from, from, not from the point of view of standards and specifications, but in, um, in both commercial building and infrastructure, there are two international movements which are relevant to this. One is designed for deconstruction, which is I would say arguably not necessarily the place to start, but at least it's looking at the, you know, the end of life fate of that building if it is rebuilt. Um, but I think the other, and again, this is, is only a part of the question that we're asking, um, there's also a look at, particularly in terms of structural and foundational elements, the ability to test and reuse existing foundations. And this is in, in areas of the world where there's you know, very, very dense urban environments, so it's not necessarily as relevant to New Zealand. But the thinking that rather than assuming you have to design everything, including the structural elements of a building from scratch, there's a movement to say, are, are there ways that you can incorporate testing fit for the purpose testing for those foundational elements and reuse them for another building that goes on top. I suppose one thing I would add that's a little bit further to Jeff's point is that I, I think um, it's certainly talking about the building fabric, absolutely longer design life seems advantageous. Um, we generally, because of the efficiency of the systems within the building, there are you know, potentially earlier breakpoints where it would make sense to upgrade those for energy efficiency reasons. Thank you. Uh, there's actually a, a related question here on Slido. So thank you for your questions on Slido. Please keep them coming. And the question is, should retrofitting old stroke historic buildings be given more carbon credits than building new with all new materials? Um, uh, with all due respect to the questioner, the question of carbon credits is a, is a problematic one. Um, in, in terms of a mechanism from doing that, but the sense of the question, though, is a really important one, um, that uh, should there be virtue um, rewarded um, for, uh, re, um, for re retrofitting and using uh, existing buildings? I mean, from, from my perspective, there's certainly value in retrofit, but you don't want to go too far. Um, so, you know, there, there's always things that are more cost effective, you know, it's, it's very cost effective to do ceiling insulation, for example, and underfloor insulation in older buildings, whereas to do, you know, wall in insulation, you have to remove all the cladding and things first or remove the internal wall, wall coverings. And so I think it all depends on the type of building. You know, I live in, a, in an old house built in 1904. I'm never going to make that as airtight as a new building. And so in, I want to stay in that house because I really like it. But at the same time, um, you know, building new would actually give you much more opportunity to make that building much more airtight. You know, you're just never going to achieve quite the same results with retrofit. So I think to an extent it makes sense to prioritise, but I think there has to be kind of cut-off points where you say this far is far enough. At least that's my perspective. So we've, um, I'll respectfully disagree. Um, we, we've got some good examples of retrofits um, 
that have achieved passive house standards, which have achieved very high levels of performance. Um, when you look at the cost of, let's say you've got an existing window that you want to replace, if you look at the whole capital cost of that window, the payback period is very poor. However, if you're replacing that cladding or that window because of another reason, like it's a leaky building, your opportunity to go back with a higher performing product, you look at the, the incremental cost of going from a base build, base building code product to something higher spec, that actually has a decent payback period. That's something we can actually calculate in it's probably less than 10 years. Um, so we've done a number of projects in Canada that have seven year payback. Um, by spending 10, 20, 30% more during that retrofit process um, and just being smarter about how we apply those products. So uh, right, exactly right though, just doing it for a pure energy perspective doesn't make a lot of sense. But to your point, when there is the opportunity to replace that element, going to the next, the next level, it makes a lot of sense. And I would agree with that. If you're retrofitting anyway, put in the best stuff you can. You know, if you have to replace the cladding, put in the best insulation you can because it costs very little and it has a massive, massive difference. So I agree with that. Thanks. Um, there's a, 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 in my own mind, there's a related question down the bottom here. I'm sorry that you, the, the screen you've got in front of you is a bit too small. Um, um, but it's about incentives. That was looking at um, um, old, old buildings. But so um, this question is, will zero carbon buildings be given favorable treatment with council, i.e. free processing services to create incentives to the public to shift their choices? Is, is that a subject that's ever come up in discussions, Sally? Um, we, we had many people who would quite like free building consents. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, let me take that question elsewhere in the panel. Um, would that be a useful incentive? I can tell you without a doubt that our company will give you a much lower fee if you are targeting a better building. Um, we're right now, you've got about three days left. Um, we're offering to do passive house certification on large projects uh, for 50% of the fee we'd normally charge you. And we've had a number of people jump on that option. Um, it doesn't cost a lot less. So there are a number of designers, there are builders, there are engineers, there are people out there that if you are a client and you want to do something better, you will be rewarded for that in the fees. So I can't help, can't help counsel. Um, they can't, they don't have much power either, but there are certainly people in the industry that are very interested in helping you. Thank you. Um, let me move on to some materials question. There was a very interesting one which has now dropped off the screen because at that point it only had one vote, but I'm going to go to it anyway. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's now got eight votes uh, from Jerome. Um, Firth concrete has lower embodied carbon than any other concrete globally. Um, how can it reduce it more? Um, Firth is a Fletcher company, isn't it? C can you tell us about that very low carbon concrete and how that happens? Uh, yes, um, I, I won't uh, dive into the technical details. Um, I, I guess the, 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 the fundamental difficulty with um, the cement and concrete, which is really the, the driver of emissions, if you like, is that in, in rough terms, about a third of it is related to the energy that you use to produce the cement, mm. and therefore where you have alternatives, so for example, we use quite a bit of biomass and are moving towards also some other alternative fuels next year for the Golden Bay Cement Plant, which is, I think, um, the 30% reduction in coal use that Jeff talked about, it will probably get us to a 40% reduction. But that's only a third of the impact. The more difficult two-thirds is that inherent in the process of making cement, the, the chemical process itself generates carbon. So to get a big, to get really, to truly get low, low, low carbon cement, you have to work out alternative materials that can give you the same performance but aren't what we typically use um, to make cement. And that's a technical challenge. It's one, in fact, that we're putting huge amounts of research into at the moment. So the lower carbon, so the reason why um, locally manufactured cement in New Zealand has lower carbon is because there's in, of the energy part of, of, of the equation, and that's great. Um, but it, you can only address a third of the carbon emissions through that route, so you actually have to, to go further. You really have to look at the product. 
the, the, the chemistry of the product itself. So hopefully that wasn't too uh, confusing an explanation. Um, but it derives from using, yeah, using alternatives to, alternative energy mixes, mixes to... Can I just drill down a bit further in that? Because I'm really interested in um, the Fletcher experience here. Do you want to venture a rough idea idea of time as to when that research might come to, to fruition and, and does that um, give you um, an economic opportunity in terms of the technology um, to create a business out of that internationally um, so how, how's this looking in, in technical and economic terms uh, I would say that the issue uh, with any sort of innovation is the scalability of it not um, not necessarily the, um, the straight technical issues, um, but I mean it's active research for us at the moment and certainly various alternatives exist globally. I wouldn't say they're necessarily large scale, but we have to find something that's a, um, relevant to our local environment in terms of the, the alternative materials you could use. Thanks. So I yeah, please do. Build on that as well. So, for concrete, if you're, if you're making it from Portland cement, typically about 70 to 80 percent of the carbon footprint, as kind of Helen was indicating, is from the cement itself. So, most of the impact is in concrete is from the cement. It makes up only about 10 percent of the mass, but a very high part of the carbon footprint. The reason, the key reason for um, Firth's low impact um, is because the Golden Bay cement that they're using has substituted uh, 30 percent of the coal for biomass, and then they're going to increase that significantly more by using tyres, which may not sound that green of fuel, but when you're substituting coal, tyres actually burn extremely well, and they also contain a portion of natural rubber, which is, can, can be considered carbon neutral. So, you know, that, that's a good um, news story, but really if you want to bring down the impact of concrete further, you have to be looking at sub, what are called supplementary cementitious materials. So getting the cement out, or at least some of the cement out. So you can actually have material, like a, they're called geopolymer cements that have no actual Portland cement in them. They're made from waste products of the coal industry, for example, like fly ash, and waste products from the steel industry, ground granite, blast furnace slag. Um, and so they use those materials and some additives to create a cement-free concrete. Um, but in the New Zealand context, we have something quite unusual. We don't have a lot of fly ash because we don't have coal power stations. Our cement mill doesn't produce the right type of um, slag to use. What we do have, though, is an abundance of volcanic ash. And so we have the opportunity to substitute about 30% of our cement with volcanic ash from predominantly the, the central North Island volcanic plateau, um, and that's already underway. So both um, Golden Bay Cement and HR Cement in Tauranga are already actively exploring their te technology. It's been used in the past to build some of our dams because it makes incredibly strong concrete. And I think, for me, that's the greatest opportunity that we have in cement and concrete in New Zealand. And I think that will have a, a really significant... Um, it'll reduce the carbon footprint by another sort of 25% at a concrete level. Mm. Th these are encouraging stories because um, a big dynamic in all of these um, enormous transformations to a zero-carbon economy um, is the pushback from uh, vested interests, i.e. Um, people who have a technology and they're trying to maximise their return on it for as long as possible. Um, so uh, across the panel, uh, um, what's your sense of how our building material um, producers here in New Zealand are responding? Uh, you've offered some encouraging stories there about innovation, um, but what's that balance between a real appetite for innovation uh, versus trying to milk the existing technology and assets for all they're worth? Uh, 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 Helen needn't answer this question <laughs> unless she wants to either personally or on behalf of Fletcher. <laughs> I, I can say that I've been finding it a, a, a struggle um, trying to get a manufacturer who's got an existing revenue stream that they rely on um, and they've got an existing customer base who's buying that product, trying to get them to abandon that product and, and sell something else has been a real struggle. Um, thermally broken windows dry, does my head in every single day. Uh, it's a quarter inch plastic that's stopping 30, it's using 30% of the energy. If we just had a very simple, this very simple solution um, and it just hasn't got market viability for some reason. Um, so yeah, I find it every single day. It's very difficult to get manufacturers to push a new product um, because it takes away from their existing revenue base. One opportunity I see is that as a nation we have a lot of aging plant 
like manufacturing plants. A lot of them were built in the 50s, 60s, 70s. They're getting old and they have to be replaced. And so I see that as a significant opportunity, but it's kind of like the, the retrofit point that was brought up before. If you have to do it anyway, you might as well do something kind of great. And so one opportunity we have you know, is to replace, because you know, when we're talking about embodied emissions, a large proportion of that comes from thermal energy, the stationary heat. So it's from burning natural gas, from burning coal, from whatever it happens to be, to produce the high temperatures you need to manufacture stuff. We also have things in New Zealand like geothermal steam, for example. If we can relocate plant at the right time to make use of that geothermal steam, we can bring our carbon footprint down. If we use things like hydrogen and other alternative fuels produced from electricity, for example, and we do these things at the right time when the plant's being rebuilt anyway, we can then, t we can then use that opportunity to kind of build in the technology we need. And I've, you can already see that happening. Can't, I can't give specific examples because they're confidential, but there are companies, large companies in New Zealand, who are looking at new plant and are specifically considering this now and actively choosing where they put their plant to maximise the use of the resources that we have locally, which is very encouraging, I think. Thanks. Um, Helen. I think, so, so to your point, I guess you'd ask yourself, you know, why is this product not necessarily a good product? And it may very well be the energy mix that's used for that product. And I kind of think of them in sort of three tranches, if you like. There's sort of the easily renewable or electrifiable level of energy input to a product where um, I think most of the low-hanging fruit is, is, is probably there or I think most of the efficiencies are already built in. Then there's sort of a middle tier of sort of medium to low temperature process heat. And now there are more technologies becoming commercially available and at, industri sort of at an industrialised scale where you can potentially electrify some of those natural gas sources or coal sources. But then the final problem is really high temperature process heat where there isn't necessarily an alternative. So you're, you're really just trying to look at a source of that heat that's simply lower down the, the, the carbon impact scale. So I think it's a mix of solutions because sort of the nature of the, the manufacturing really determines what solutions are available. But we are talking you know, primarily about embodied carbon. So in fact, the energy that you use to make that is generally going to be a significant source of it. So you're yeah, working the, your way sort of up the hierarchy of what can be renewable or electrified, or, and, and then if you're into, at this, at this point of time in technology, if you're into a fossil fuel source, thinking of the best one that that could be. Um, however, a, a, another point is to, to, for manufacturers looking at new plant, thinking about what technologies may come on, street in 10 year, on stream in 10 years is also something that we certainly factor into our, our our planning that you know something may not be achievable now, but it makes sense to design a new plant in a way that can adopt that technology in a period of time. Can I just take this one stage further? Um, we've focused this discussion on materials quite heavily in this last little bit uh, around the energy component of that um, and making sure that energy is as clean as possible. Um, but um, there's, is there a greater goal here that there are some um, wonderful products out there that we know about or could be coming um, that are um, far less polluting, not just in um, carbon emissions terms, but um, more sustainable overall, but deliver not only that lower impact at the construction stage, um, but um, deliver real operational um, benefits um, over the life of the building. Um, not just on energy, but in, in other environmental impacts. Is there a real um, synergy between the nature of that product and the nature of its performance um, in the building? I, th I think what I was, I think what you're getting at or, or what, I, what I interpreted as, or just what I want to say, one of the two. <laughs> um, the earlier kind of question about how do we reduce carbon, um, concrete's carbon footprint further is stop using concrete. Um, we've got other materials that can do the same thing or better, um, but it's you, you need a design team, you need a client, you need everyone on board from the start with that in mind. That needs to be a design goal. And if that's not a design goal for your building, if, you're, if your goal for the building has nothing to do with carbon offsets, you're going to end up with a big, heavy concrete building, um, which costs more. The big, heavy buildings cost more. Um, we build a lot of three-story, four-story, five-story precast buildings in Auckland, um, which are really heavy. And when there's an earthquake, 
heavy buildings take more foundation work to resist those loads. If you have a lighter structure, you have less concrete, you have less, co you have less cost. So we need to think about the impacts of, um, yes, we have a different durability criteria we need to think about versus concrete and timber. Um, but there's all these knock-on effects that we're, we're seemingly ignoring. So let's do the best we can to reduce, to reduce the production part of concrete. You can't replace concrete. Um, it's, it's got its place. But at the same time, if you're building a four-story building, let's think about can we do it out of timber. If you're doing a six-story building, can we do it out of timber? Yes, we can. It's been done the world round. Well, far higher than six stories. And we're in the process of, we're planning to plant a billion trees. Far too many of them are going to be radiata pine. And that's going to be a useless thing to do if the uh, radiata pine is only shipped offshore as logs to be used uh, for pallets and scaffolding in China, um, where all that carbon is then re-released. So it seems to me there's this incredible opportunity for New Zealand to take that radiata pine, which is not a great timber in itself, um, but through engineering solutions, turn it into a building material that sequesters the carbon and therefore people who use that should be rewarded for that in some way other than just not being pinged with a carbon um, emissions tax. Oh, Rod, you set me up perfectly. This is one of my big things. Radiata pine grows so, so fast here. Um, the problem is once you cut it up and make it into timber, it's pretty lousy to build framing out of. Um, but it's wonderful to manufacture into other things. So it's, it's the perfect building material if you're going to use engineered timber. CLT, glue lamb, um, parallel lamb, um, parallel strand timber, any of these products that require extra, extra effort to go into them are in huge demand globally. Huge, huge, huge demand globally. You can't get enough of them. And we're sitting in this climate that is just perfect for it. We've got a tree, we've, like you said, we've planted way too many of. And it'd be a, really, a real shame to turn them into pallets 25 years from now. Why don't we turn them into really good, really sensible, very smartly constructed buildings? So what went wrong in Christchurch that so few buildings were built that way and the vast majority of the rebuild in Christchurch is tilt slab concrete panels? Uh, what went wrong there? How did we lose that fantastic opportunity? How do we make sure we don't lose it again as we continue to build out and renew Auckland and other um, built environments around the country? What went wrong in Christchurch? How do we stop that happening again? Um, what I see in the market right now is there's not enough supply to, um, to meet the demand for engineered timber. Um, so you don't have the expertise and the designers familiar enough with the timber products. Um, and it's partly, partly this idea that we have to treat every single piece of wood that goes into our buildings to make them durable. Um, we think keeping water out of buildings would be a much better way. Um, and that's what most of the world does. Um, so I, I think that in order to grow a mass timber industry here, we're going to need to borrow some wood from somewhere else for a while, get used to how we use it, how you design with it, and then slowly over time we start to build some factories, um, find some places that are doing some mass timber at scale that we can start to take over um, that kind of industry. So that's what's missing right now, I think, in the market and that adoption. Maybe if I could add to that. I mean, we, we do have a reasonably good engineered timber industry in New Zealand, so we make glue lamb. We have been making CLT cross-laminated timber um, up until recently, although I think XLAM has closed its plant in Nelson or is in the process of closing its plant in Nelson and building another one in Australia. Well, they've already built it. Um, so, you know, the, the, those products are made here. We've got a very big engineered timber industry, and for those of you who are interested, um, the Wood Processors and Manufacturers Association will be releasing an environmental product declaration in the next week or so that will cover engineered timber. If, you, if you're interested in finding out the kind of impacts of that in the New Zealand context, it will cover all those products. Um, my, my sort of thought to your question on Christchurch is that it's all about what people are familiar with. You know, in Christchurch there was a lot of pressure to get things done quickly. I know it didn't quite work out that way in the end and people still kind of felt that it was all too slow. But I think they felt it would be even slower if we introduced new things that people weren't familiar with. And so I think that familiarity, the standardisation to the points made earlier around, you know, what's, what's been properly fire tested and fire rated, you know, is it, is it performing to the building code requirements? If it's a new product, has it been properly tested? What is the acoustic performance like? There are so many kind of open questions and we don't have a lot of experience that's slowing things down. 
We do a lot of work with Lendlease in Australia who are building um, mid-rise timber buildings and looking at their life cycle performance. And I know from talking to them that you know, it's sort of these building code type requirements, making sure that everything ticks all the boxes that's challenging. And they're actually having to import product from Austria and Europe because you know, it's gone through all the compliance testing, it's a more familiar product, even though there are things manufactured locally that they can't really use because it doesn't tick the boxes yet. So I think there's a bit of a learning curve there. And over the next few years, I think that learning curve will be kind of, will move up it quite quickly. And then you might start to see more sort of novel forms of construction, be it timber or other things. But sticking with the familiar or incremental um, shift that moves us slightly on from the familiar um, is a dreadful fate, uh, for not just in this, but across um, all of the enormous transitions and transformations we have to make. Um, so how on earth do we get people beyond the familiar um, to help them um, have, uh, help them um, innovate far faster and with greater confidence and um, greater success um, in building materials um, so we can get some actually transformational change in this. And how do we do that? Science. <laughs> you, you, innovation is science. It's the practical application of somebody who's come up with an idea, put it through some tests, come up with a, a product. That is innovation. It's science. It's coming up with an idea, testing it, and then building on other ideas from others. So um, back to my opening kind of statements, until we start trusting the science, innovation becomes very, very difficult. My feeling is that there will always be a sort of a lead time for innovation, though, in this context. You know, you're building buildings that last 60 years or 90 years or 100 years. Um, we've just come through the leaky building crisis. We can't afford another one. Um, you know, and so we have to be we have to be confident in what we're doing. But what we probably can do better from is learning from international experience, because something that's come up before, even when we were chatting as a group earlier, is this, this very sort of, has it been tested in New Zealand? Does it work in New Zealand? And yes, we do have some specific New Zealand conditions, you know, geothermal, we, you know, we've got to deal with seismic performance, we have to deal with the fact we're very coastal and that corrodes a lot of metals, et cetera, et cetera. There are some specific things, but we're not completely unique in the world in having those things either. And so I think we probably can learn a lot more from international experience. And one, one final thing that will help where it's appropriate is getting back to off-site construction. If you think about it, if you build an entire building element or a component of a building, you can actually test the component, which gives you an ability perhaps to be, to, you know, to use more innovative materials because in fact you're testing the performance of the in, 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 potentially an entire, entire floor of a building, an entire structural element. So that may be a way to um, be more innovative with the materials because in fact it's the performance of the element that gets tested, regardless of, in a sense, regardless of what it was constructed from. I think the challenge that we, that we do see in, is that we have innovative ideas, we think we know how they work, but we can't actually explain it to council. So say, hey, this got used in Belgium and worked fantastic. Uh, we don't know why but we like to use it in, in, in Auckland for this building. So you go to, go to council and say, hey, we want to do this. We worked over here, and they say that's fantastic, but we don't have the same building code. So that's the challenge is the, the seat that I'm sitting in. There's not very many people that actually can translate what we want to do in new innovative products into a language that complies with the building code. I'm sure you see it all the time. What would help you, Sally, um, in um, trying to um, connect up the, these drivers and, and these opportunities from a, a consent point of view? How, how do you bridge that gap uh, with Sean? Um, Sean tells us how to do it. Um, <laughs> actually, I'm joking a little bit. Um, we do have to assess both the design and the products and systems selected against the relevant clauses of the building code. If you can't tell us how that design is going to perform or that system is going to perform, we can't approve it. Um, in, in the lower buildings, the under 10 metres, there's a lot of scope around the testing and the appraisals. In the higher buildings, often that information is extrapolated out into how it might perform and I might receive, or my team might receive a report from the likes of Sean using his science, looking at the evidence and the test data and to tell us a very coherent story around how this particular design complies. But I think, and it might lead into some other people's thinking, how can we do this as 
quickly and as cheaply as possible. And I have to say, when I hear cheap and quick, it worries me about what about the quality. Um, but we work on a time and attendance basis. So the more complete and quality your application is, where well, you're telling us the story very um, robustly and aligning it with the building code, the less time we spend on it. We spend a lot of time asking you for information. It either hasn't been supplied or it's not clear or it's very generic. It's not specific to your particular development. So all of that stuff provided to us up front really, really drives efficiency and then it drives cost down. Thanks. Um, the most popular question um, I think relates very well to this uh, line of discussion we've been having. Um, and the question from Peter is, it's all well and good setting targets for low carbon construction. What incentives or penalties are there for developers to build beyond uh, New Zealand's minimum standards? I don't think currently at the moment there are. There's certainly not penalties. No, certainly not penalties. Um, the big incentive by going beyond the building code, you know, not following the acceptable solution, actually thinking about what you're designing, is it's more likely your building is going to be pretty good. You won't end up in court. Um, that's what we always tell people when we're designing a building is if you're trying to follow a recipe for a single family home to build a seven story apartment building, it's not going to turn out the way you think it is. We need to actually think about these things and um, come up with solutions that we know can work and we can prove. So to me, that's the big incentive, is if you spend a bit of extra time looking at better products, looking for more um, innov innovation, spending some more time in design, you're less likely to get sued. Is the, uh, Jeff? I, I see very few incentives or penalties at the moment. You know, I don't really see much happening in the New Zealand context, but I think there's huge opportunity in that as well because we're starting from a low base. Um, if you look internationally, you know, you see government driving it through public buildings, for example. You know, we will require that all new buildings, so in Germany and France and the UK, all new public buildings over a certain dollar value, a million euros or whatever, um, require green building certification. They require certain, you know, things around having environmental product declarations or embodied energy requirements or whatever it is. And you see that a lot more coming from government and sort of leading by example. You also see it from large corporates specifying they want green buildings because that's where the new corporate head offices. And so if you look even across Australasia, look at Australia, Sydney, Melbourne, etc., where all the sort of CBD real estate, most of that's green building rated. I think office towers have got over 90% coverage uh, Green Star in Australia because everyone's competing in that area for the best, most sustainable, nicest place to work, etc., etc. So there's a bit of healthy competition that goes on there in the corporate context. And I think in New Zealand we did have requirements, but some of them have gone away. So there was a requirement within building new schools. There was, I think, 8% historically allocated to green building. And I think that got kind of taken away, is my understanding of it. So there, there've been, there's been a bit of come and go, but there are probably opportunities with, you know, whatever Kiwi build becomes, um, with, you know, large-scale building projects that we could do more. I, I got another penalty, actually, is, is there's a lot of expensive stuff we do in this country that doesn't add any value to the building. Um, my, my big one is nogs and walls. Uh, there's studies going back to the 70s saying that's not required. It's not required in 3604 framing, uh, yet we still do it. Um, so there's, there's penalties to building the way that we do, is that you're wasting money on things that don't matter. <laughs> Uh, thank you. That, that sounds like a very um, uh, productive line of questioning to pursue, but I, I won't because I'm, I'm trying to. I'm going to move on through some more of the um, popular questions from um, uh, people with us here. Um, Auckland Council has declared a climate emergency. Um, have there been uh, have there been no tangible moves in the area of building consents in light of this declaration? You're right, the council has declared a climate emergency. I referred before about council's role as a building owner and the steps we're taking. I referred to council's role as a policy maker and its encouragement of more intense development around public transport hubs. I also referred to our role in our waste program. But council is a building consenting authority as a regulator 
and we can't just throw the regulation out because we like the idea of sustainability. As I think I also mentioned, we receive an application with literally nothing sustainable about it at all, and it meets the building code and we will approve it, which is why we believe the building code settings set by the central government regulator need to change. Um, just, I'm hi, hi, totally hypothetical, I've not thought about this before, um, but given there has been a declaration of an emergency, um, if uh, there was identified to be a particular um, piece of infrastructure or a particular building that was particularly vulnerable to um, king tide or whatever, um, would, uh, and there was a desire for really speedy action on that, would the council from a consent point of view fast track that? Um, or, or not? There are provisions under the Building Act for works done under an emergency, um, and they are essentially legalised afterwards. Um, consent sought from the building consent manager first, but the actual consent sought after it um, through the Certificate of Acceptance Programme. So there, there definitely are opportunities for genuine emergencies, whether it's coastal inundation. I'm not sure you could describe that as a, an emergency now where the life and safety of occupants um, are threatened by that building yep. being in place. So it's a matter of degree. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, next most popular question is um, about uh, limiting waste materials. How do we limit waste materials, of which there can be a huge volume, um, from, um, during and from the actual building construction process? Um, any takers on that? Because that would indeed help reduce the embodied carbon in such a, mm. a project? It's, certain, it's certainly part of it, and, and to give you some really depressing news on, you, you know, New Zealand performs way below global good or best practice on, on construction waste. Um, so it's actually a, a big area for, for improvement in general. Um, I would say, but you know, because we know that, that materials lock up a lot of carbon, then then clearly waste minimisation is going to is going to reduce the carbon associated with building. However, it's something that we don't um, necessarily we don't really have the incentives to track it particularly well because it's not really part of the. Generally speaking, it's often something that you don't actually have to report in regulatory terms. So I think there are some sort of there are levers, you know, and whether that's changing the way that um, changing the way that waste is dealt with it, at the, and to require more regulation of it, or so, so I suppose you know, many of you in the room will, will probably be familiar with a really successful UK initiative, which was just to increase the waste levy by a certain percentage over a period of time, which let everyone in that industry, for example, know exactly what what they were going to have to pay in addition the next year if they didn't reduce their waste. I'm not suggesting that's necessarily the lever for here. Um, I'm more suggesting that we actually don't really have built-in incentives for waste minimisation. So those companies that are doing it and those waste providers that are doing it, many of them doing an excellent job, um, are, re are really doing that from their own initiative. So I think re you know, recognising that it's part of the issue, recognising that you know, there is an embodied carbon component of waste that we're just not seeing is probably the first stage. But also looking at ourselves at, at critically in the mirror and saying, you know, we pride ourselves on, environment, on our environmental ethos and actually we are betting way below average on this particular issue. I think there's some opportunities in, uh, in the modular space and the standardization of some typologies. Um, we're definitely seeing a lot more people asking for products coming from the jib factory, for instance, to be made to the length that's required for the building so that you don't have an offcut that goes to the, to the waste. And a lot of the manufacturers will do these sorts of things for you. You seem to talk to them. Or it's, it's understanding um, that if you order a, a sliding door wrench slider to um, you know, 100 mils larger than, than something else, all of a sudden that creates a waste um, and you know, something in the background. They have an offcut that they can't use. Um, and so I think there is a, there's room in the industry overall to kind of come up with some standardization. Then we can start to say that, hey, we've got windows that are uh, 200 millimeters is kind of the rough opening sizes we have. Then everyone in the industry can start to optimize their supply chains to deliver things in those increments of size. 
right now we're ordering for windows is horrendous. We're ordering things to the eighth of an inch, which is you know three, four, five, six millimeters, um, and those get measured on site. Um, so the more we can start to push industry towards standardization, standard floor plans, Housing New Zealand is doing a great job of this on standardizing floor plans. So they have now got some typologies that they're going to roll out around the country. Now all these suppliers can start to gear up and say, hey, we've got this many windows to build of the same size. We can start ordering stuff to match those sizes. Um, so that's a part, of, part of this. Thank you. Actually, um, Helen, there's a related question from somebody um, specifically to you. Does New Zealand have skills and capabilities to do modular build? Uh, current examples are all shipped from overseas with cheap labour. Um, yes, we do. Um, there's a change in thinking required. You sort of have to take your construction hat off and put your manufacturing hat on because essentially that's what you're doing. You're, you're manufacturing a very high quality product that performs in a certain way. Um, to a specification with, the, you know, the, um, the, the modular construction that, that, that we do, the investment we're making, the tolerances are incredibly tight, the accuracy and the quality is in, incredibly good. So we do actually have that skill set. Maybe when we think about it, we're not seeing the skills, because we have a strong manufacturing sector, so maybe we're not seeing that, um, that ability to do it because, because we're looking, looking at construction skills. However, one thing I would say, in addition to that is, you know, design to standard sizes, um, Sean's point, um, modular construction, tight tolerances, but it's, um, there's a lot less bespoke work associated with that. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's faster to construct. So it actually unlocks a lot of capacity in the sector in and of itself. And I'm absolutely confident that it's a skill set, skill set that we can that we can develop. Thank you. I, I'm pretty bullish still on on Kiwi Build, um, despite all of its troubles in the early days. Um, if you think about when when government announced the policy of Kiwi Build, I don't want to talk, dwell on Kiwi Build, but um, what it did is it set up a supply chain where a factory could um, a, a company could make a business decision to set up a factory to do prefab, knowing that there was orders coming. But that's a two to three year timeline to set up a factory to actually deliver. Um, so what we're seeing in the market now is for the first time, these factories that are New Zealand based are now producing those buildings. They're now coming out of the factories. So the one and three year tar one and two year targets for Kiwi Build may or may not get there. But you look at the three year target, uh, I think we're gonna eclipse that you know, because we have these factories now starting to deliver at an incredible scale the country's never seen before. Um, we do still need people to put them together on site. I think that um, it's not a huge leap from what you, what you normally do, um, it's a, but it is a different way of thinking. You're not, a, you're not a carpenter anymore, you're an assembler. You're putting together a kit of parts on site. Um, so yeah, I think it's coming very quickly um, and we'll look back five, ten years and wonder why we did it any other way. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. I was about to say yep. that's an area where our central regulator, MB, is really recognising gaps in the building code. and while they haven't really focused on sustainability, those modern methods of structure like prefabrication are definitely on the agenda. Um, and I just, sorry, one yep. tiny final point. I would keep your eye on the current and the future infrastructure construction in Auckland to see what this looks like on large scale because that's, that's a model for major infrastructure investment is, is to do it as, um, yeah, to, to build it offsite. Um, so yeah, the CRLs and the Waterview Tunnels, I would look at those examples. Um, the disappearance of the Slido questions is my cue from the organisers that time is up. Um, I will just answer um, briefly one question there, which was uh, what defines a genuine emergency? Um, in relation to councils declaring uh, climate emergencies, I looked at the Civil Defence Act and actually a climate um, emergency fits perfectly within the um, remit of the Civil Defence Act because the Civil Defence Act um, is to cope with um, 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 un, uh, um, unprecedented um, and unexpected um, um, events um, that existing systems, uh, i.e. business as usual, can't cope with. Um, I think by any definition, 
um, um, current systems can't cope, um, is not making material um, improvement in our chances of um, responding adequately to um, climate issues. Um, so um, so the, the, I would argue there is a real emergency here. Uh, tonight we've only been looking at a very particular part, um, and it was a very good focus to have on the way, on the materials we use, and to some extent how we use them um, in our buildings. Um, so um, a very big thank you um, to the panel, um, to Jeff, to Helen, to Sean, and to Sally. A big hand for them, please. Thanks very much indeed. Um, as we found uh, last night, and I know we'll find again tomorrow in, in Christchurch, um, these are um, tremendously complex um, interlocking issues. Um, and so the enormous challenge we have in a country, but it's around the world, um, is to find new ways to uh, work on these in far faster. Um, my great hope is the Zero Carbon Act uh, will get us going on that because the Climate Commission will be setting five-year carbon targets, which will be declining. Um, Government will have to deliver, um, have to propose strategy um, that um, the Climate Commission deems uh, will make material differences and improvements towards those targets. Um, so I think as a sort of a, an organising principle, an organising structure, and um, this is the experience of the UK over the last 11 years where they've significantly decoupled emissions from economic growth and brought about some amazing transformations such as a two-thirds reduction um, in the cost of electricity um, from offshore um, wind farms um, that um, I'm not trying to pin all my hopes on the Zero Carbon Act, um, but I think as a way of thinking about these issues uh, will help us to advance on these very complex things um, in a much more effective way. Just very briefly in closing, um, you'll have seen from the emails that um, the Green Building Council has come up with this wonderful idea of not um, giving koha to panellists, um, uh, but thank you hugely for your contributions, um, but rather um, making a contribution to um, a charity um, that you, the audience, choose. Now, this is winner takes all. As you'll see in the email that you'll get, the three charities are Sustainable Coastline, Habitat for Humanity and Auckland City Mission. So please, please do respond um, to the email um, that you'll get about that after the event. Please do vote. It is winner take all, so it is quite competitive. Um, but um, it's all in a very, very good cause. So, um, um, so lastly, just my thank you um, to the Green Building Council for um, organising this terrific session, um, for our panellists, for you, for our hosts here in the Town Hall. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, I just wish you all the, well in, uh, all the best in your work. Um, and, um, and please, please do enjoy some more um, networking and uh, refreshments um, at the back of this concert hall um, for a short while after this, half an hour or so. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.